Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have Arnie, published in 1992 by Zeppelin Games, coded by Chris Butler and graphics by David Taylor. I think this was a budget game that I had way back in the day on tape. I think I bought the original. The tape version has this nice little unassuming tape loader. I can see from the text screen debug window there that the tape header is mostly blank. It just contains the file name information and the load address bytes and stuff like that and the end address. So it does do this kind of auto boot thing because the data that loads over the top loads over the top of the vector and the uh, cassette buffer it then loads a bunch of extra data but it's filled the memory with this repeating pattern, which is quite intriguing. I'm just going to use my tape tool to have a look at the raw tape file to see what it does. And yeah, the, the IRQ vector is restored, but it points to loaded code instead of the default IRQ vector. So that's how it does its auto start. So this is one of the semi-standard ways of doing it. But to be honest, I would have filled the tape buffer with code. So we can see in the graphics map that there are some sprites that have been loaded already. And this is before, actually, it's finished loading the loading screen. There's this great big repeated pattern all the way through a couple of pages, a couple of Vic banks, rather, of, of this data. Now, this data seems to be repeating on 256-byte boundaries, or 100 in hex. Looking at the code, uh, I can see a jump indirect with uh, A000 in hex. The indirect jump is with parentheses with brackets. I can see another jump with 8000 in hex. This looks like it's copied from the kernel. I can see some JSRs to the kernel. I can see some uh, what looks like well, that's interesting. It's it's doing uh, some arithmetic with AC, AD, AE, and AF as 16-bit quantities or two-byte quantities. Uh, it's incrementing AC and AD, which is part of what is used for the load routine. I think it's it's obviously deliberate that it's copied this section of the kernel. I have a feeling it's because uh, whoever was writing the tape turbo loader decided to reuse and reuse the, the routine in the kernel for incrementing AC and AD and comparing AC, AD, AE and AF there, FCD1 and FCD uh, B, right? But the rest of the kernel routine includes all of this reset routine code as well. So I think they just copied uh, the entire 256 bytes from the kernel and repeated it all the way through memory for whatever reason. I'm not going to really try and speculate on the reason that they did that. Uh, the debug memory view didn't seem to show that any of the code was executing in, in this copied chunk of kernel code. So that's really quite intriguing because it's uh, because it's copied over uh, what looked like at least a couple of vic banks right i think it's probably there to fill the memory with a repeating pattern to make it harder to freeze and compress the game that's that might be it but to be honest uh, the freezer cartridges would apply some kind of dictionary-based compression anyway, which would compress even this kind of repeated pattern. It's not completely random, right, because it's repeating every 256 decimal bytes. So here's the loading screen. Uh, so we've got the nice little flashy border and it's still continuing to load, load the game. Now it's loading uh, an awful lot of what looks like structured data starting at 4000 in hex. It doesn't look like uh, pseudo random data, so it's not highly compressed, I don't think. I can see various repeating patterns in there, right? There are those vertical columns. This is uh, the data in memory translated as sprites, of course. 
because it's the, the sprites debug graphics map. While it's loading, I'm just taking the opportunity to update my debug notes. Here we go, the screen's going to go blank any second now, I think, because it's reaching the end of the memory now. It's loading at the beginning of memory again now, where the loading screen data is just warping ahead slightly. The tape doesn't load this quickly. Now this load A with DD0D and then the logical shift and then the bit test uh, extracts a bit based on pulse length from the tape, which is kind of like a standard, one of the standard tricks that you can use. Uh, the pulse length is then rotated into the byte and then it is uh, stored. The X register is pretty much always zero in this routine and that's how it's able to use the uh, indirected zero page comma X addressing mode rather than comma Y where the Y where the X value is added to the zero page value before loading the low and high address uh, compared to the indexed indirected with Y variant which adds the 8-bit value in the Y register to the 16-bit value from the zero page address. So AC and AD in the kernel and AE and AF are to do with the tape buffer routines and also the screen routines as well but here they're being used for the tape buffer and it's JSRing to those two kernel routines anyway to increment and to test the tape buffer addresses so um, I don't think the code was was uh, JSRing to all of those copied kernel routines anyway so the tape turbo loader seems to be JSRing to the kernel to keep things nice and small, which is fair enough, right? Now, you know, it's really possible to include quite a reliable uh, tape turbo loader just inside the, uh, the tape header itself. If you squish down all the bytes really quite well, if you optimize for size rather than optimize for speed, you can actually fit in quite a complex reliable tape turbo loader so again I don't know why the the tape header wasn't being used for this loader I mean the technology this is 1992 right the technology certainly existed at that point for using the tape loader uh, 1992 was uh, almost but not quite at the end of the the Commodore 64's uh, game publishing life cycle right uh, I started professional games development work uh, for a company in 1994, so yeah, 1992 was certainly towards the end of that. So here we are, here's the little title screen, uh, character based, pretty much sure about that. There's some blank memory there on the screen, and there we go, there's, there's the screen green memory there by the looks of it. Yep, so the video memory is at F400 and then there's a character set at F000. <clears throat> so the character set, there we go. That's that's in the debug view from ICU64. You see, I love this version of ICU64 because the windows are all separate and it's really uh, very quick and easy to zap all the way through memory to see what's going on very quickly it's a very nice user interface for quickly analyzing the memory. So I think we can guess from this that the character set for this game screen is different. Um, okay, so we have... Ah, okay, so the character set that was used for the title screen is also used for the for the score panel down at the bottom. I can see this, the, the score digits and I can see the, the rifle and the rifle's name. Um, an RLI AR-15 rifle in this case. There's a little split on the screen there, which is the vertical scrolling split, which is usually 8 pixels. Uh, sometimes it's, a it's possible to make it a little bit smaller, but 8 pixels is pretty much the standard. 
So we have the sprites there at the, uh, at the last Vic Bank, which is not really a surprise. Uh, what is unusual is that the the game is using uh, the character set right at the end. Um, so it's it's more common to see the character set at the beginning of the Vic Bank just because it's easier to update that memory. Now I'm editing the bullet sprite here so that we can definitely see that the bullets are actually multicolored sprites. Uh, they're not high resolution sprites or anything. They're not characters. Uh, it's just basically sprite based bullets. Even though I've made the, the sprite-based bullets quite large, the game is still doing collision. Now this is interesting. Look, I'm seeing this area of memory here being green indicates read. So I'm seeing uh, a square piece of memory or a rectangular piece of memory in the Commodore 64 continuously being read as the enemies and bullets and stuff like that were moving around the screen. So it seems to be reading uh, what looks like character-based bullet. Yeah, look, see, it's reading. It read a whole rectangle, and now wherever anybody moves or uh, and uh, shoots, we're getting these green trails around in, in RAM. Now, this memory view is aligned to 256 bytes horizontally, so uh, zero, uh, 100 zero zero bytes in hex horizontally. And, and that means that we have 256 pixels across and 256 pixels down, which is 65,536 bytes, which is 64 kilobytes, because kilobytes are 1,024 bytes. So we can see that the map data seems to be uncompressed characters uh, in memory. Uh, there's the character set for the game at F800 and then the game over text which is part of the title screen and the score panel is at F00. Right. So there's there's the score panel data in the same screen and then there is the game screen. Let's switch it to multicolored mode and there you go it's a lot easier to see now. The interesting thing is is that when I'm looking at the memory view I don't see any other um, character screen being used for the game character screen so it doesn't seem to be using a double buffered screen it seems to be using a single buffered screen which again is quite unusual right because we've got uh, what looks like eight-way scrolling going on so I would have thought that the game would have used a double buffered screen but no which is cool uh, if the map data is uncompressed in memory uh, then it's possible to do a complete rectangular copy from top to bottom all the time. So actually, that makes that makes the uh, multi-directional scrolling a lot simpler. Like in other games, in previous videos, and I'll link the specific video below. If you try and scroll in certain directions, it's quite difficult because you you are trying to copy copy memory in the screen bank in the opposite direction to where the raster beam is going down the screen. So then you have to split the screen and you have to time it precisely. In this, if you're doing a rectangular copy or if the game is doing a rectangular copy from uncompressed character-based map data, then you can always do the copy from top to bottom. Because your screen memory is not overlapping with the map data, you can just do a copy from map data to the screen, just top to bottom, and you don't need to worry so much about the timing for the screen data copy, as long as you beat the raster line as it goes down the screen. Anyway, so I'm having a look now for the multiplexer code. So the multiplexer code, I, I'm looking for a, an update to a D, D010, which is the Sprite MSB register. And this looks like 98 is being used as an index register into the uh, Y sprite y position table at what was it b zero zero so the index table at nine eight zero zero look if i have a look at the memory for nine eight zero zero then this these 16 bytes here or one zero bytes in hex look the whole memory address range that was highlighted there contains values which are less than or equal to 15. so that indicates to me that that table is basically uh, an index table 
which is what you normally do when you want to sort things quickly, is that you don't move the X position, the Y position, the color of the sprite frame, and you don't swap them all around. You swap around indexes because it's a lot simpler and quicker to swap indexes when you're sorting or to, limit to, or to manipulate indexes when you're sorting. So this sort table, uh, I need to find out now uh, where the sort table is being updated. Now this version of ICU doesn't tend to play very well with breakpoints in zero page because this is an old version of Vice. Okay, so let's do it a different way. So let's look up the opcode for store accumulator uh, with zero page, which is uh, 85. So I'm going to look for in memory uh, 85 and then 98. And I can hunt all the way through memory from start to end looking for 8598. And hopefully, oh look, there's only one occurrence. So 388F and disassemble 3A. Oh, look at that. Store A with 98, load A with 80, pushes, pulls, load X, F8, TXS, RTS. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So let's add um, a label for the sprite index table just to make the code when we disassemble it easier to read. Now, hold on a second. This disassembly for this routine, where it's doing a whole bunch of stores and loads and pushes and pulls and branch on minuses, this does look really familiar, doesn't it? If I scroll up through the disassembly, we can see that it's a very unrolled... Well, it's not a loop. It's very unrolled code. It's doing the same thing, but with small changes over and over and over again. 16 times by the looks of it because that's how long the index table we think it is but it's doing a whole bunch of extra code here which is different so it's doing this it's updating the sort index table in two different ways that's interesting look so that updates values into the sort index table but it's pulling the values from the stack <laughs> This, this routine definitely does look quite familiar to me. I'm going to double check this in a minute. But yeah, this is pulling values from the stack. And if they're positive, well, if they're, if they're minus or negative, rather, which is what the BMI instruction does, then it keeps on pulling values from the stack. But when it encounters a positive number, not minus number, basically, then it stores it into the uh, descending uh, zero page sprite index table values. Wow. Okay. Yes. Fine. Just updating my debugging notes. Bear with me for a second. Now, before it pulls out those values from the stack, uh, the code above it is uh, using what I think is the sprite Y position in those zero page locations. It's, it's a value, certainly, but I think it's the sprite Y position. Let's just double check that, though. I mean, you know, I don't want to make too many assumptions when I'm looking at new code. But, you know, my, my gut feeling is telling me 99.9% .9 certainly that that B8, for example. Oh, yeah, look, see, look, there's the store to D001. So store D001 is, is the sprite Y. Sprite 0 Y position, right? So, <clears throat> yes, it's loading from B8, comma, X there at uh, 3CB5. And it's loading previously the X from the sprite index table, right? So that's definitely the sprite Y position table is B8 in zero page. The reason why the code uses zero page like this is because the instructions are shorter and also quicker to execute when they're accessing zero page memory because they don't have to read in two bytes for the 16 bit memory address. So that code is taking the sprite Y position, dividing it by two, and then using that 
value to then store a value into the stack at that particular position but only if that particular position in the stack is negative if it's a positive number in other words there's an index value already there it pulls the value it pulls the stack pulls the value from the stack which decrements the stack pointer or the value for the stack pointer rather but it doesn't destroy the value in memory it just decreases the, the stack so basically then it, it, it looks for a free value in the stack where it can store the sprite index register hmm this is a very fast and very familiar sort routine uh, if you've watched my previous videos, you'll know which uh, game or games use this kind of sort routine. Does anyone remember? I certainly do. I'm going to find that video. Hold on a second. Well, I found the forum post. And the forum post was in Lemon64. And it's basically Dan Phillips, who, uh, amongst other things, wrote Armalite. And he described how the sort in Armalite worked, which is using this very, very familiar uh, stack-based sorting method where it takes the sprite y value divided by 2, uh, tax and then txs, which is transferring the accumulator into the stack pointer, and then doing this stack manipulation to insert a known value, which is the sprite index value, uh, into the stack at particular positions based on the sprite y position. And if we have a look at the code side by side, we can see here at the beginning of the code, look at 374e, in Arnie anyway, in Armalite it's in a different, different position. Armalite also has uh, more sprites than Arnie, so the sort routine in Arnie is shorter, but it's basically the same, conceptually speaking, in terms of functionality, right? So let's let's really put them side by side. There we go. We can see it's a TSX and then store X. So it's storing the stack point or whatever it is currently at the en entry to this routine. It's doing the same thing, loading the sprite Y position, shifting it right once, TAX, TSX, BPLA, BPL, and then loading it and then storing it, you see? And then it's doing that as an unrolled piece of code for every single sprite y position and every single uh, corresponding sprite index value. Really quite a very cool way of uh, sorting your uh, index values or producing a list of sorted index values based on sprite y position divided by 2. Now, my pre one of the, my previous videos was looking at turbocharge, and I also f uh, noted that this sort routine was used in turbocharge. And here we are in my previous turbocharge video where I found the same basically kind of code used for the sort routine for its multiplexer. I think Nan Phillips gave uh, Chris Butler uh, the routine and permission to use that kind of sort routine in turbocharge. So it's no real surprise that the same sort routine is also used by Chris Butler in Arnie because they're the same person. I guess Dan could have used the credit in Arnie as well for the sort routine. But you know, uh, back in those days, code was heavily borrowed between programmers and, and games anyway. I mean, Armalite borrowed, in inverted commas, the uh, disk turbo loader, right? And, and that was also in one of my previous videos as well. I'm really intrigued about this large green rectangle that's copying large amounts of data from that green rectangle area to the screen, in other words, the map data to the screen. The screen, when it scrolls, doesn't seem to be updating any of the color RAM. The color RAM is visible on the right-hand side of the memory display there. 
I have a crazy idea. Let's use charpad version 2.7.2 .2 and use the import snapshot option. See if we can find what I think is map data. The uh, well, the map width should be 256 bytes because that's that's the width of the of the green rectangle that was being copied. Well, no, I mean that's 40 characters, but the 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 stride length is 256 bytes because that's the width of the memory view. Let's just guess that it's 128 characters for this map. There we go. And the start address is, well, 4,000 in hex. And there we are, left, right, top, bottom, ordering of the bytes with the expected character set. Let's change the uh, colors around. So we're on a per map color basis. Uh, OK. So the tree leaves are green, as you would expect. Let's scroll down and zoom in. OK, so I've got the colors slightly wrong. Uh, using 11 and 12. OK. So that's color 11. That's color 12. If I remember rightly. The background color, well, it's not black. It's actually uh, swapped over. So the top of the tree leaves is green. And then the shadow underneath is black. So let's change that over. So that should be multicolor green. And then that should be black. There we go. That's uh, quite a good way of doing it. It means that we can have more color variation horizontally on the screen, probably by using a raster split or just changing the, the background color as the screen scrolls up and down with the rest of split. That might be one way, a good way of doing it. So there we go, there's the map data. In Charpad, we can scroll around to look at the map. The character set also looks quite uh, jam-packed full of characters, as you would kind of expect. But yeah, basically the whole game is there. There's this little area here, by the looks of it, just updating my debugging notes. Bear with me for a second. These notes files are always committed to source control, and I link them in the videos so you can see what I've been writing, uh, as well as copying a large green rectangular area during scrolling the screen, we can also see those trails. I'm really interested to see how the game processes those trails with respect to collision information. And there we go. So OEOF, I'm pretty sure, sits inside the map data area at B60B in this case. It then loads the, the character into the accumulator and then that code was transferring accumulator to Y and then loading from 1C A6 indexed with the character that was read. So 1C A6 looks like a uh, ta data table of, of collision information. So there's different values, 0, 1, uh, 2 that I can see. Maybe they mean different things. Well, they probably do mean different things. If we have a look at the character sets, then actually the the character the characters are all kind of like jumbled up together. There isn't any ordering to them as such. So that's why we have a whole bunch of uh, zero, one, and two values. Now I'm guessing that zero is going to be uh, walkable for the player and probably one and two. One is probably, probably, I don't know, uh, not walkable, so solid map 
areas and then two might be areas of the map that that kill you straight away perhaps or maybe uh, there's a difference between walkable non-walkable and then uh, collidable by bullets that might also be the case so some walls will be solid for bullets and some of the other areas might not be solid for bullets but not walkable on in other words solid for walking so let's fill the whole data table which is going to be 256 bytes long so 1c uh, a6 to 1d a5 and let's fill it with zero and see what happens in the game and well there we go i can move and i can walk over the trees and i can move over the the barbed wire i got shot and the heat uh, well the landmines still blow up with very big explosions right um, but i can just skip all of the walls and the barbed wire fences can i walk over the water well there we go yes i can and then i get to this area in the map which you cannot obviously usually walk to hmm okay that rectangular area of characters in the map oh look it's the game logo that you could see there in the in the character set view so if we go back to charpad we can see the same thing in the map that was imported there but if we go back to uh, and, and restore the values there we go but if we use a different character set there we are that's the score panel character set but it also contains the title screen arnie logo so there we are so the the game title screen arnie logo is held within that watery area of the map that you cannot usually uh, walk to and that you couldn't normally see while you're playing the game of course great so that saves a little bit of memory i suppose i expect that was probably by design or maybe just like a lucky coincidence that that area of the the map was able to be used i'm going to save that um, arnie map uh, charpad project file to the debugging details source control as well so you can get that from source control and you can have a look at the map data yourself if you have charpad of course so i think we'll leave this video there i only really wanted to have a look at the sprite multiplexer and the scrolling and the map collision and to see how the bullets were done and stuff like that and they're with they're using sprites so thank you very much for watching this video if you like these kind of retro Commodore 64 games memories then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel and if you really like the content then a super thanks will really help with funding my crazy electronics projects that are also used with the Commodore 64. Take care, have a great day or evening wherever you are.